DSC is one of those must attend events. It allows me to see current vendors and also to foster new relationships with new companies. Uh, DSC has always had some of the big companies here, but there's also new startups. And that's what's exciting. There's always somebody out there new or even a uh, current larger company Everyone, who's presenting new for technology. I can't miss session. this because technology the changes and evolves so rapidly, so much changes year to year. I've seen that this year, where My things have just progressed, and if I'm not here to see that, I'm not bringing constant value to my customers and just being ahead of the game. You can't just go on and look at the technology. You have to come here, you have to see it, you have to touch it, talk to the vendors, talk to the manufacturers, ask them the questions you want to ask them, not what everybody else is looking for. To me, it's very exciting, and you get to make those connections, and you get ideas. It's like a big idea factory here for me. And then when I get back to the community, I want to do that. So I think it's must to talk for sure. Amy Hausman and Yaoling Chen from the MTA in New York, and I'll let each of them introduce themselves here in just we do have encourage questions, so as we get going through this, you should see a little green button in the lower right hand corner of your screen that says ask a new question. If you have any thoughts, comments, things you'd like us to expand on, go ahead and just hit that, put in any questions you have, and then as you see other questions coming into the screen, feel free to vote those up and we'll, we'll definitely cover them as we've got plenty of time today during our conversation. Uh, as I mentioned today, we're really going to focus on art on the big screens. Uh, and in the beginning, we're going to talk a little bit about the background, uh, the funding, selection of technology and the art, some of the challenges, uh, as well as some of the things that the future holds for the MTA. Uh, we do record this just like we do all of our other Hangouts. Uh, at the close of today, it will be posted out on the Digital Signage Federation website. So if you just, when you visit the website, there's a section called Hangouts. Scroll down a little bit and you'll see all of our archives there. This recording will be there as well as all of our past recordings. So if you uh, find this format interesting and you want to learn a little bit more about some of the other topics we've covered over the last two years, feel free to browse through those, uh, those Hangouts and recordings that are there. As I mentioned, this is all put together by the Digital Signage Federation. Uh, we're a non-for-profit uh, community voice for digital signage. While you're out on the website, I'd encourage you to check out uh, and consider joining the DSF. As part of a new membership, you get two DSCE certifications, you get discounts on events, there's industry networking. You can partake in a, um, hangouts such as this as well. Our next hangout's coming up on September 21st, and the topic's going to be digital signage as a class. Uh, the students from Laverne College in California are going to talk about how they created a class out of digital signage and have actually built a business out of it on campus. So that's our topic. Mark your calendar for the 21st. Again, you can sign up for that on the DSF website. Other thing I want to mention is, you know, to mark your calendar for March for the Digital Signage Expo. It's coming up March 20 through the 31st. It's in Las Vegas as always. Uh, you can learn more at dsc2017.com. But great event for you to attend. Not only fantastic educational uh, tracks, but on the exhibit floor, you know, nowhere else can you walk in and see displays and software and content and all the pieces of the puzzle in one place. So definitely mark your calendar for that. The other one to keep track of is coming up on October 25th, uh, the DSC and the DSF will be holding a breakfast in New York City as part of Digital Signage Week. Details aren't quite finalized yet, but those will be out on the website, so stay tuned. Uh, and again, if you are attending the Digital Signage Week, you know, mark your calendar for that breakfast on October 25th. Uh, as I mentioned, the topic today is going to be the art project that was done at Fulton Center in New York City. And uh, you know, to set the context before we get into the, the conversation uh, with Amy and Yaling, just want to show you a few of the photos to help give you an idea of how massive these LED displays are, some of the fantastic artwork and uh, imagery and graphics that you're going to see here. And as part of the recap email that we'll be sending out uh, later on today, um, there will be a couple of links to videos provided by uh, the MTA so you can see you know, just some of this award-winning content and, and how it all turned out in a video format. Um, and again, I just want to encourage everyone to ask questions. It always makes it more fun if we've got a, a lively and engaged audience. So anything you want to learn a little bit more about, just hit that little green Ask a New Question and we'd be happy to get to your questions as we flow through things here. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Amy and Yaoling. I'll start with you, Amy. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role with the MTA? 
Um, sure. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, we're happy to kind of entertain an audience around the country. Um, Amy, I'm Amy Hausman. I'm the Deputy Director at MTA Arts and Design. I've been here for almost 11 years. Um, I've been at the MTA for 18 years in a variety of capacities. Um, but I'm here in the Office of, M of Arts and Design, and our office is 30 years old. We have um, commissioned many, many works over the course of 30 years throughout the transit system in New York. Um, our transit system spans 5,000 square miles. We're not only the subway, we're also buses, commuter rails, bridges, and tunnels. And we work with all of those agencies to commission um, different kinds of artwork, permanent artwork, um, temporary work like graphic posters and photography. And we also run a music program which presents over 7,000 musical performances within our subway uh, and rail environment every year. The goal of our program is really to enhance the experience of our customers. And with 2.6 billion customers using the mass transit system in New York, it's a lot of people, it's a lot of eyeballs. Um, and we were really excited a couple of years ago to start working with our team here, including Paul Florangis, who um, a lot of you know, um, who is a great champion of our program. Um, we were excited to be able to launch a digital arts program in 2014, November of 2014. Um, and Ya Ling, who joins me, um, has been instrumental in making that program a success. We've had a lot of fun learning uh, new things about digital signage and how it can affect um, passengers and the passenger experience in New York. Excellent. Well, same question to you, Yelling. If you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role with the MTA. Yep. Um, my name is Yaling Chen. Hi, everybody. Um, very, very nice to meet you guys here um, on Google Hangout. Um, I am the curator and project manager uh, for the MTA Arts and Design. Uh, I think we started at about the same time. So this marks my 11th year uh, with Arts and Design. And um, like um, my colleague here in the office, we each uh, take on multiple hats. So in addition to managing our more permanent uh, person for our projects, I am also working very closely with Amy on our new um, digital arts program. Excellent. Well, I'll start with you, Yelling. The first question here is, you just want to tell us a little bit about arts at the MTA. How does that fit into the mission for the transportation agency? Uh, do you mean uh, specifically on the digital arts or, or art in general? Just in general, how does the MTA and, and arts, how, how do those two things fit together? Um, I think to me, uh, on a more personal level, it's very important that you are actually making a, a difference to everyday people who has to uh, use mass transit uh, to go about places. Um, it's really uh, it's really a kind of uh, most democratic place where you don't need to spend money to go to a museum to see uh, our work by um, a host of uh, artists who are very established, who may be in their mid-career or they are up and coming. And this is the place where um, we uh, work closely with the artists to create our work for the, uh, stations that uh, for everyday people. Great. Uh, I guess, Amy, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I just, you know, we have commissioned over 300 artists to do permanent installations throughout the city. And those installations, for those of you who haven't seen them, might be mosaics or sculpture or glass that are actually installed into the architecture, integrated into the architecture of, of the stations themselves. Um, and the idea is that by bringing art and design into the environment of the station, it will make everybody's day better. Um, and we often talk about um, when they built the subway in New York, which opened in 1904, there was a clause in the uh, engineering and construction documents that said that all attention would be paid to the beauty of the appearance of the subway as well as its efficiency. So that idea of bringing really good design into the system is something that we really hold strongly to, to and has been a cornerstone of our program over the past 30 years. Um, and we're thinking a lot that, about that a lot right now while we're thinking about digital 
integration and how we bring digital signage into our environment, how we can bring it in in a well-designed, well-integrated way, working in conjunction with some of the historic elements like mosaic and glass and beautiful tile work that's in our system, how, how it, along with everything that it brings with it, conduits and other kinds of things, can be well integrated. And it's a challenge for us and one that um, lots and lots of folks here at the MTA are thinking a lot about um, and working to, um, to achieve. Great. Well, I think previously you mentioned uh, the digital art program started in 2014. You want to tell us a little bit about how it started and the, the very beginning of it? I'll, I'll start with you, Amy. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we started working, um, thinking about digital signage before it actually really came about. We always wanted to do a, a video program. We were interested in working with artists who worked that way. So when we started bringing digital screens into the system, we saw a wonderful opportunity. Um, and the Fulton Center is a brand new temple of transportation here in New York that opened in November of 2014. Um, it was a project that was started after 9-11 in 2001 um, to build a new kind of transit hub in Lower Manhattan. It brings together, I think, 14 different subway lines in one location. It creates a really beautiful new public space here in Lower Manhattan. Um, and one of the objectives of that space was not only to be a place where people would come to use transportation, they can go, um, there are stores there, there's uh, you know, all kinds of retail and restaurants and things like that that are in the process of opening, um, but it was also a way to be able to showcase new types of advertising and so there was an initiative to bring in uh, 52 large-scale digital screens into that space. Um, uh, Westfield is the uh, is the master leaseholder there and manages that property for the MTA, um, and they are working uh, with ANC to uh, establish um, digital work there. So we showed all kinds. There's all kinds of advertising that's shown on that digital screen and customer information on some screens, um, and it gave us the chance to um, establish a, a percent for art digitally. We have a percent for art, for, for permanent artwork, but we wanted to be able to establish it digitally. So um, we started thinking about what kind of work might um, compel people to stop and take a moment, a New York minute, you know, to stop and, and look at these screens. Um, and so we commissioned our first artist named Garcia, uh, Gabriel Garcia Colombo to do the very first work that opened in November of 2014. Um, and it, it was a great success and people really loved it. Um, and so we've commissioned our the second piece, which we can talk a little bit about, by um, Chris Sickles at Red Note Studio, which is um, up and um, on exhibit right now on those screens. And we're working on new projects right now um, for the future. Excellent. Well, Yelling, anything you'd want to add to how the very beginning of the program? Um, the um, the opportunity uh, that allow us to um, launch this new um, program really has to do with the opening of uh, Fulton Center, and it's so far um, the first, uh, in a way, fully digitally integrated uh, transit hub that uh, we have here in New York um, uh, under the MTA. Um, with this 52 screen, uh, it becomes a kind of digital network and also it's, it's a form of immersive digital canvas that allow us to actually engage um, new media artists who often are not um, having the same um, level of opportunity um, to do more permanent uh, material based, uh, more physically based artwork, which is one of the things that we are very excited to be able to offer them this, this space. Um, so that's why um, it's, a new, it's a new challenge for us to, to be able to um, get to know this, this new opportunity and also this new um, media. Hmm. Um, that would be the point that I would like to, and we, we both learn from, from, from each other as well. Well, you, you mentioned there's 52 screens, so I got to imagine there was a, a pretty big investment made in this. How did you go about allocating funding for this type of art project? Um, 
the screens themselves are installed in the station, and luckily the cost of that was not something that came out of the art budget. Um, our, our department is responsible for the content, so we can speak to you more directly about the content. Um, the screens themselves were uh, part of the larger scale installation and project, um, along with our partners at Westfield, and they'd be able to talk to you more specifically about that. Um, for our end, though, um, we needed to be able to allocate resources um, from our very, very modest budget um, to be able to commission artists to create work. Um, and um, we have done that now twice, and we're looking at different ways that we might approach that as we go forward. But we looked at these first two years um, as a kind of a test period, as a kind of a beta testing in some ways, since we've never done this before. Um, and um, with Gabe's work, um, Gabriel Balshia Colombo, as I mentioned, was the first artist whom we commissioned. And he's someone with an incredible uh, resume and um, portfolio of really great digital work. Um, he's a professor at ITP, and um, we had seen his work in a couple of different venues, and we really were engaged by it, and we thought that the public would be as well. Um, and he was such an incredible partner for us as we launched into this brand new um, arena, um, because he brought so much technical know-how. He's an incredible artist, so he's got a great eye, and he knew what people would like, so the content wasn't concerned. But he also really was a great guide and helper uh, and helpmate for us in a lot of the technical things. Um, and we put them through the ringer, I have to say. Um, and we had great partnership um, you know, with our colleagues at Westfield and at ANC also to help us to realize um, the launch of that first, um, that first project and program. Um, so you guys should take a, a look at the video of some of that because it, really, it, looks, it looks really great. Um, when we approached the second commission, uh, we were looking for something that had a real different feel, and we approached Chris Sickles at Red Nose Studio, who is an illustrator and does stop motion animation. And we were familiar with his work from our graphics and illustration program um, and always really loved it. And we thought that he could create something really charming um, and that had a really different look and feel from Gabe's work, but also that was a nice juxtaposition to the very contemporary architecture of Fulton Center. Uh, and we've been thrilled um, by the reception of, of that work. We did have some challenges. Um, I don't know if this is a question, Ryan, that comes up later, but one of the things that we've been working out over these first um, two commissions is the timing and how the timing would work. So Gabe's piece started off being uh, a 30-second piece that we were showing six times a minute. No, six times a, an oh, hour. Right. Sorry, I wish it was six times a minute. Um, yeah, six times an hour. Um, and then it was interspersed with advertising. So it was a matter of kind of thinking, you know, does that work? Do people stop? Do they realize that it's not advertising? Do they realize that it's part of the art program? How does that work? And we looked at that and kind of assessed that. The piece that's been commissioned now by Red Nose Studio is called The Blowing Bowler, and it's showing for two minutes at the top of every hour. So it's really much more of an event. Um, so during the course of that hour, there's advertising, there's information about Fulton Center that's published by different people, but then um, for two minutes from 10 o'clock till 10.02, for example, um, is this very short animation. Um, and we're looking to kind of see how that works and what the response to that is. It almost serves like a clock now that you know whenever you see that it's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning or it's 11 o'clock in the morning. So we're trying to find out what where the delta is, what, what works best in terms of commissioning this work so that it really does read as, um, as artwork. Um, in conjunction, but also complementing um, the digital array and the advertising that's being presented. So I'm just curious, how are you determining that timing and how to break up those day parts? Are you just standing there and observing people, or how do you get feedback for that? Uh, we work very closely with our, our colleagues at Westfield and our colleagues uh, at ANC, and of course with our, with our team here at MTA and MTA Real Estate. There's been a lot of people kind of part of that conversation. Um, you know, we look at this kind of as a percent for art. We get a percent for art to commission permanent artwork in our system. Up to 1% of a portion of construction costs goes to allocating, you know, uh, permanent artwork. So we were looking at that model in a, in a, in a, in a way for this digital art program. Um, and I think we're still open, you know, to kind of see how the next commission will work. It also, of course, depends upon the content and what the content, I think, will be um, for the next few commissions. And I, I, uh, if 
I may add, like um, these digital spaces, they are not like a uh, dedicated uh, space for art only. It's a shared um, space and environment with other venues like advertisements. But art often serves as a moment of uh, uh, to for people to take a break from mm. that constantly running a very busy um, um, ad advertising messages. So we, of course, have to work closely, like Amy mentioned, with uh, our partners at Westfield to kind of uh, come up with a scheme that makes sense to audience. Um, so that's why uh, in the beginning when we just launched um, our first commission, um, Gabe's work, uh, we had the idea of um, playing the art content um, 30 seconds and six times each hour. Uh, and then from there, um, it's a lesson learned um, during the, the process that we um, adjusted to uh, become two minutes uh, at the top of each hour. And so you also can see the, it's also about the nature of each work. Uh, in Gabe's work, the 30 second give you a, a kind of a slow motion, uh, very poetic uh, visual display. It's like a 30 seconds of respite in a very busily paced environment. But the, the two minutes piece by uh, Chris, it's a story. He's using his, um, his um, sub stop motion um, uh, animation to tell you a story of how New York City um, subway uh, um, evolved and developed um, to the, the type of car and uh, system that we have today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, there's, there's just it's two different kind of concepts. Um, and I don't think we've necessarily settled on one or the other. I think we hope very much that there's room for conversation um, with our partners as we move forward uh, with this program. So you mentioned partners. Is, is your partnership primarily with Westfield and ANC, or did you get involved in helping to select the hardware and the software and the installation, or was that all handled by them? It, it really was. It was handled by the MTA, of course, through our architecture and our capital construction uh, department who built Fulton Center, and they were very intimately involved. Um, we did not get involved with the technical details from that end. Right. Um, but I, I will say Yao Ling has learned an extraordinary amount just in terms of uh, the content and how to, you know, how to kind of use content management um, in her work with ANC, um, who's been doing the content management for Fulton Center. Uh, it, since did that beginning. pose a lot of challenges since you weren't brought in from the very beginning to help select that and you really just were told here's what you have to use? Like if you, if you were doing it again today, would you want to be involved from the very early stages to help select that? I don't know. Honestly, we, we have our hands in a lot of pockets. We're, we're in a lot of pockets. We have our hands in a lot of projects. We're working on a hundred permanent projects right now. Um, and we have a pretty small staff, so we were happy that the experts were able to kind of work on the technical end of things. I think um, we've been very happy with the way that the work looks um, on the screens that they've selected. Um, as you mentioned, you know, there's a couple of really giant screens um, that are uh, really huge. There's also a raceway where um, that goes around a round kind of center part of. Fulton Center. So I think part of the challenge for us and certainly for the artists has been thinking, um, as Yao Ling said, about the canvas, which is these 52 very disparate screens, and looking to see how one can program um, artwork to really seem like a cohesive installation. Um, and that has been interesting to think about, and also to think about the passenger as they're moving through Fulton Center. Their goal is to travel. They want to get to work or come home and go, you know, go through and go home. So how do you capture their imagination and their attention um, so that they're delighted by what they see? Uh, and, and those have been some of the challenges and opportunities that we have when we're thinking about this work. Okay. Well, we've got a question that came in from Steve at Pixel Fire, and he wants to know how would someone go about submitting a concept for future art, and just how often are you selecting new art? And then his other question is, are the artists paid? Okay. Do you want to take that? Uh, since this is a, uh, a very young program, uh, we uh, currently we um, select artists 
um, based on a curatorial uh, practice. Uh, we constantly are looking at uh, new media artists. We have we we have a re like artist uh, repository um, with us. We talk to the um, our experts in the industry, and then we uh, look extensively into their portfolio, um, internally also um, externally, and then from there we have we would come up with a short list of uh, artists that, that we would invite them to uh, propose uh, a concept, and then uh, and from there we would kind of end up um, having a um, curated. Um, show our work with the space. But we do hope uh, in the very near future to um, to uh, issue an uh, open call to artists through a web-based platform. So then the, all those um, in hope to kind of really broaden or reach out to the artists in the country um, to think about this very attractive and also challenging uh, digital space in New York City, uh, hoping that uh, they can kind of pro propose or uh, come up with an, an, an idea that, um, that's great. Yeah. So yeah. We, we do commission work all the time. And the work that we commission for our graphics program, for example, is um, it's, it's always serving our customer. So the customer is the most important thing. As I mentioned, we have 2.6 billion folks who use mass transit in New York. and um, Yaling used a wonderful term. It's the most democratic place. Every kind of person, shape, size, color, um, you know, everything uses the subway system in New York. And so the work that we commission, we really want to uh, reach out to those to those people. Um, the work that we create is usually tied in some way, maybe not literally, but tied in some way to the idea of transportation or the idea of the experience of being in New York. Um, and so that's something that's interesting and important to us. Uh, and we do hope, as Yelling said, to do um, some calls to artists um, pretty soon so that uh, we can get an even broader range of artists we're looking at. We would recommend that people, everybody who's watching, should start following our social media through Instagram or Twitter or uh, Facebook or Tumblr. Um, MTA Arts is our, is our handle. And we would love for everybody to follow us. That's a way to really learn about what we're doing, the different kinds of projects that we're taking on, and new opportunities that there are for artists to become involved in our program. Uh, the other question that you asked um, is if we pay the artists. Of course we do. Uh, we always pay our artists. Um, the fees are uh, maybe not the same that a giant commercial operation may pay, but we do pay um, honorarium and, uh, and fees to the artists for the work that they create. They also retain, of course, the copyright of their work. Um, and um, the work is usually commissioned for a period of time to be shown on these uh, screens. Um, we hope actually, right now we're showing these works at Fulton Center. We also have been um, taking little excerpts and showing them on some of the other digital media um, opportunities throughout our system. Um, in New York, we have uh, new kiosks called On The Go that are digital uh, digital kiosks that provide customer information, travel information. Um, they've been providing advertisement as well. And we've been creating little snippets that can be shown on the On The Goes as well. And we hope very much to be able to expand that as things move forward. Great. Well, the follow-up question I think you answered was, does MTA retain the license rights to the submission? But I think, as you said, the artist holds the rights to it. Is that correct? The artist always holds copyright for any work that we do. Um, but uh, we, we, will, we compensate them for the period of time that they're uh, showing the work through, through our system. And as Yelling said, it's kind of a plum, it's a plum gig because you have so so many eyeballs, so many people um, from all walks who are able to see this work. Um, one of the challenges that we've had is, as I mentioned earlier, is this distinction between the content, advertising content, and art content. How do we create that kind of break? So with Chris Sickle's work, The Blowing Bowler, which is up right now, we actually um, programmed in a couple of seconds of dark screen um, that then lead into a title slide. So you can see the artist's name very clearly. You can see MTA Arts and Design. You understand what it is that's a little bit of a different experience than the advertising that you might just have seen. And that's something that we're working on to refine, to find the best way uh, to do that so that that credit is really there and people know whose work, who the artist is, um, that, they're, that they're enjoying. OK. Well, we've got a couple of questions that have come in that are pretty similar. Um, first is from uh, Lyle Bunn. 
He's just asking, how do you measure the ROI on the digital display media? And also Brad from Blinds.com asked a, a very similar question is, you know, are there any measurements in place on how people are interacting or paying attention? So how are you measuring your results? Well, it's a very good question. I think not one that we can personally answer. Uh, it's a question I think that probably goes more to Westfield and their work with advertisers. Um, and I mean, our our work has always been more uh, anecdotally noted, and we hear from social media, we hear from people who write letters to the artists, um, how people respond to their work. Um, and I know through Gabe and through Chris both, they've had incredible contact through di from different organizations and people um, loving the work that they're putting up there, and that's been very satisfying to us. But in terms of the actual ROI, it's not a question that we can answer. Um, if Westfield was here with us, I'm sure that they'd be able to answer that question um, more conclusively. Well, when, when yeah, at one point when we, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was just, just going to add that uh, at one point we did have that conversation with Westfield that they um, they had planned to kind of track the eyeball movement of the um, audience um, passing through the space. But I mean, again, we will be curious ourselves to um, to know what would be the number or stats that would come up. Yeah, absolutely. Based on that study, yeah. Okay. Um, another question that came in here is somebody wants to know where they can learn more about the on-the-go kiosks. Is there anything online about that project or anywhere you could direct someone? Yeah, I think so. They should definitely Google the on-the-go project in New York. There's been a lot written about it. Um, they can definitely go to the MTA website, which is mta.info, um, and there may well be more information there about that project. Um, Paul Florangis, who um, is on the board, I think is has led that project for the MTA and can provide great information, and maybe even did a Google Hangout about it, I think. Did he, Ryan, a little while ago? Did he talk about on-the-goes? Not, not one that I was part of, so. Oh, okay. Not yet. Um, well, you should get him to come in and talk talk with you all about it. Great. Okay. Um, so another question here is: Are there any plans to put hardware in place uh, where you can allow motion interaction with it? You know, things like infrared cameras in Microsoft Connect, etc. Or is your plan with the art just to be limited to rendered video? No, I I thought that was a great question. Question. Um, Ryan, uh, actually, uh, for the newer uh, generation type of uh, monitor that has the built-in camera, uh, which would allow a kind of uh, interactive component to the to the artwork, um, definitely uh, something uh, in the future. So this is that's the exciting part, and also um, as we uh, open up uh, newer stations with new, uh, more advanced and up updated technology. That, that's something uh, we have in mind, mm -hmm. um, to have uh, artists create work that can kind of engage our customers at different uh, location stations uh, at the same time or a different time that they can, in a way, establish a kind of virtual communication in time and space. So uh, um, right now at Fulton, it's pretty still a kind of um, static dynamic content, meaning video or animation, that doesn't have sort of like kinetic or interactive element to it. But we do look forward to the future when um, those hardware uh, and uh, capacity are in place that we can start kind of uh, think about towards that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. The on-the-go kiosks, which don't fall under our department, but those kiosks do have interactivity, um, and so I think that that's something that, well, maybe coming down the pike. We have been looking, as Yellen said, at a different artists who create more kind of gaming and interesting things where there can be some interaction. One of the things we have to think about from a safety perspective is that um, you know, five and a half million people use the subway every day, so crowding around certain spaces is something that we've got to think about for all of the artwork that we yeah. create, not just this digital work. Those are some of the things that um, become challenges for us. Uh, 
So kind of like the Pokemon Go and everybody playing? Yes. Yeah, not really so great on the subway. Um, because, you know, the goal of our subway is to move people quickly, efficiently, and safely, more than anything else, um, to their destination. So that's something to think about. How can we use interactivity? How can that uh, function within our environment? And what makes the most, the most sense? So we haven't gotten there yet. Great. Well, uh, a question came in more looking for feedback from the artists. Have the artists give you any feedback? Are they satisfied with the resolution of the displays, the refresh rates, the quality of the technology that's there for presenting their art? Can you talk to that? <laughs> um, in the case of, uh, of uh, working with Chris, um, he, because of the 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 type of uh, animation that he's made, he's made uh, we had to engage our uh, colleague um, from uh, multimedia production to help us um, to kind of format um, those animations for the kind of 52 of uh, screens uh, with uh, each has different type of uh, configurations and uh, file, uh, file size. So it could the logic could easily be 30, 31 by 19 feet. So it's it's um, massive. Uh, from that, the the feedback we we have back from Chris is he's really happy with the the result the outcome of of the artwork that um, he's seen um, that's been kind of deployed and then um, um, playing at those. Um, displays. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of, uh, he flew in from Indiana and saw the space and was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Uh, but then when he was able to actually see uh, the images of his work, I think he had never seen. His, his work is the little tiny, he makes little tiny models out of, you know, scraps of paper and little gum, you know, gum and glue um, and animates them. It's the really low-tech uh, way of approaching uh, this work. And then to see them blown up, like Yelling said, on these huge, huge screens, um, he was really tickled about that. And we were too. We still are whenever we walk through that space. Um, that's the joy of being able to be involved in the kind of work that we do, bringing art into the transit environment. Anytime we're able to create a new poster or bring photography or, or install a new piece of artwork, whether it's permanent or digital like this, um, is, is such an honor and such a joy to be able to bring artists' work into that environment because the audience that's looking at the work, they may be, go to art museums, they may think about art, but a lot of them don't. And so some of them, it's their kind of first experience or their first impression of seeing work. And, um, it's really exciting to see how they respond, and it's and it's a great, great opportunity for artists to get their artwork out um, to these kind of really incredible, diverse audiences of people who come from all over the world. Very and uh, speaking of that, I just want to remind everybody that uh, hopefully after today, um, Ryan can help us to kind of um, put the uh, a video link uh, up uh, on the Hangout page. Uh, that video really give you a very uh, kind of behind the scene joy, a, a, a look at how Chris was able to kind of um, make those very cute um, um, toys um, objects um, using all kinds of materials uh, to to film uh, every frame and to make the um, the stop motion animation. And also show showing him actually flew in and then be present at Fulton Center, and then be amazed by the the whole, the whole experience. So that was that was actually a very good um, video to share with everybody. And Amy also we talked about the the experience in that video. Yeah, I think you yeah. have that link. I do, and, and with the recap email that everybody will be receiving, you'll get links to both of those videos so they can, can definitely see the, the outcomes there because it, it's definitely much more impressive to look at a video than a, a still image of, of the quality of things that are here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, another question that came in uh, is, has the impact of these presentations that the artists have created uh, had, uh, I guess, an impact of sell of advertising on those displays? Any feedback from Westfield or ANC on if this has helped them sell more space? I think that it has. Um, 
when we started, when we first opened Fulton Center, I don't think, I don't know, but I don't know, think that they had all of their ad space sold already. So we got to see Gabe Garcia Colombo's piece all the time, which we loved. It was really great. Um, but very quickly, that space got bought up. Um, it's a really incredible new public space in New York, and I don't think they've had any problems selling um, advertising space there. Um, you know, we would love to have more time for art, but the advertising is what pays the bills, so we, we understand that, of course. Okay. Um, so a question that came in from Brad at Blinds.com is, were there any unexpected outcomes or things that you learned um, so that if you were doing this project over again, you'd do dif differently? Oh. Would you? <laughs> um, well, I think I mentioned that in the beginning, the first project, Gabe, um, Gabe did this project called New York Minute that um, that Yelling alluded to, um, and he chose to create, I think, 52 or more specific individual films that were shown in different films on every one of the 52 screens. It wasn't the same image. And they were all different kinds of people doing all kinds of different things in New York in super, super slow motion. Um, it was very, very engaging, and it was extremely complicated and ambitious. Um, and so the uh, organization of that material of 52, not we don't have 52 different formats, some of the screens are the same, but there's a, several different formats and creating those files to work um, in uh, synergy with one another was a huge challenge for us to understand how it would work and certainly for Gabe and for the folks at ANC. And ANC is very supportive um, of the program and the project, and we're very grateful to their help um, and expertise to really make that project um, happen. I think what we learned from that is maybe it doesn't have to be quite so complicated on 52 screens. So we've we changed it a little bit with Chris. Um, there are several different images, but I think there's only like four different films showing on the 52 different screens. Um, the next one may actually be one image showing on all those screens, but because they're all different formats and they're different locations, they all have a different kind of nature or complexion to them. Um, and so it always really does have a different different feel. So just you have to wait and see for the next one. What happened? Great. Well, the next question came in. I've got a couple of similar ones uh, from Mike at Premier Mounts. Is, and this more falls to the hardware side of things, but anything you guys saw in terms of challenges with it being in a public environment, you know, specific to things like vandalism? Hmm. Uh, there have been no issues with vandalism that I'm aware of at Fulton Center. Um, there are round-the-clock guards there. I mean, the subway runs 24-7. Um, so we never close Fulton Center, but there are guards who are in that space um, who may potentially help that issue, but I, I don't think that there have been any issues at all that I know of at Fulton. Are you? No, but in terms of uh, hardware maintenance, maybe because of it's constantly up and running, there's some like overheating issues mm -hmm. or uh, monitor or like kind of um, LED light bulb got burned out and stuff. But those are, um, I, for you guys, for the folks that are in that uh, realm, they, it's the type of issue that would, they would kind of uh, be facing every day. So I, I think that's probably about it that yeah. we know. I mean, I, I have to say, we can talk with you more about the content, because that's what we do as curators. Um, the hardware uh, we're less able to talk with you about. But I, I would like to stress, um, Yelling and I both have been to the Digital Signage Expo several years running, um, and it's been really, really fascinating to see what's offered there. Um, and the one thing that we've learned and that we know as curators is the content is king. You have to have great content, and it has to be fresh, and it has to look great. Um, and it's exciting for artists to be able to bring their work into this digital media and into this digital realm. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and we want to just encourage everybody who's thinking of it from the hardware side or thinking of it from the content side to be thinking about the art and think about design and how, that, how it really works and how it can all work um, synergistically. Great. Well, a follow-up question came in to um, just regarding formatting. They want to know if the artists give the files to A and C and they do all the formatting, or is it possible where the artist can just give you the files that are direct and ready to play on the displays? It really depends on the skill set of the artist. 
like in the case of uh, Gabe, he is so versed and so skilled in from the beginning to the end. So literally, he took care of everything, and so then he just handed us the the fam formatted uh, videos for us to kind of pass to to review and then. Um, eventually pass it on to ANC to kind of plop them into their content management system. Um, but for the current commission that's uh, playing at Bolton, um, we had to engage our um, in-house multimedia production uh, team to uh, help out to lend a hand with uh, the, the formatting work. Um, so really, I think it's, it really de is depending on on the, the, the artists and the type of work that's involved each time. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, we're happy to have, we're lucky to have a multimedia team here at the MTA, and they were really excited to be able to work with Chris Sickles um, and help organize his files. So we're glad to have that. They have lots on their plate. So. Approach to selecting artists. Um, but it's nice to know that we have fallback in house that can help us with some of those formatting issues. Great. Well, a question came in from Isabella at J.P. Morgan. Uh, she's you know, made the comment that you know art plays a crucial role in creating an ambiance and atmosphere. Can you talk about the challenges that you faced with images, both from a logistic and then a copyright standpoint? Any issues you guys ran into around copyrights? Uh, well, no, because as I mentioned, we've commissioned this work. So when we commission work, whether it's permanent work, or uh, graphic work that are, you know, uh, fixed posters on subway trains or subway stations, or this digital work, um, the, the agreement is made so that the artist always retains uh, the copyright and we uh, negotiate the usage of the, those images um, with commercial and non-commercial usage uh, clauses in our contract. Um, in terms of the ambiance, it's a really excellent question. It's something that we're thinking about all the time. How to make our customer feel comfortable, um, feel great about using mass transit in New York, feel safe, all of those things are really important. And, and something to guide the way that we think about the artwork that we're going to select, the way that we think about citing that artwork, what the material is going to be, if it's going to be digital or if it's going to be mosaic or glass or, or metal. Those are all things that go into our thinking and planning um, as we're forming a project. For Fulton Center, it was really a challenge because it's a brand new, beautiful, contemporary structure. Um, the architecture is, is um, gorgeous. It was designed by Grimshaw along with Arup, and, um, who served as the engineer. And then Arts and Design commissioned a sculptural element by um, James Carpenter that is the interior of that, uh, that large kind of uh, central space. Um, and it's a beautiful sculpture made up of over 900 perforated, alum uh, perforated uh, aluminum. aluminum panels um, that create a net um, that ref help to reflect um, the sky because there's a big open oculus or, or um, kind of light well that comes into the center of that space. So we were interested to see how that lighting kind of installation would work with these digital screens. And actually, I think it works really well. Um, yeah. You know, the enemy of light is light. So we weren't sure if the screens were going to really be bright, if they were going to have the saturation that the artists would want. Um, but they actually look great. And um, we've been really happy with them. The very large scale screens catch your attention as you're walking down Broadway. Um, and there's so many other things that compete for your attention there. Uh, but So those work really well. And then there are a lot of smaller scale screens, including this raceway, which is this round screen that goes around the center. Um, and it kind of ties everything all together, I think. Um, we have negotiated with Westfield that the artwork, um, that advertising not be placed right near the artwork. That's a standard for us throughout our system, that artwork have a little bit of um, distance from advertising um, and signage and things like that so that there's not competition and I think that helps to elevate the work um, in a lot of ways. Um, and thinking about um, you know what the experience of the customers is they're moving through a station or a space is something very important. Some people use the same pathway every single day. They see the same screens. Other people kind of meander through the space and so what that experience is is something that we think about as curators when we're working with um, the artists in Fulton Center and in other locations. Excellent. 
Well, we're we're getting down to the end of the hour here. So um, what I wouldn't mind doing is just letting you each share your closing thoughts. You know, we've talked about a lot of different topics. We've got a lot of different range of questions here. You know, for our attendees today, and I'll start with you, Amy. Um, and what would be your closing thoughts or takeaways here as they look at this project and if they're looking at undertaking something like this similar, what advice would you give? Well, I, I think, as I said before, thinking about what the content is is something that's so important. There are so many incredible uh, artists and designers who are out in the world right now creating great content. Um, and I think one of the things that we can do through DSE and DSF is to help encourage that part of, um, of things, thinking about how we can bring some of that work out into the light a little bit more and provide opportunities for those artists. We're very excited to be able to do that in New York and we hope that it'll just keep growing as we add to our digital network here. Excellent. Yelling, same question to you. Any takeaways for our audience today? Any key things to leave them with? Yeah, I have two. Uh, one is I really want to echo what Amy just said. Um, the creative content is a very um, integral and an important part of the whole digital signage era that we are all in today. Uh, we had Amy and I, we constantly have this conversation thinking how can we do to bridge the um, artistic content side with the digital signage side. Uh, can we do something and then to kind of marry the two together so then we can learn from each other and then grow from there. So that's one thing I really would like to kind of put it out there for all of us to start thinking. And the second is the takeaway from us is to um, really curating, um, commissioning artists to work to or curate the artwork for this for a space like Fulton is really sometimes it takes strategic thinking. Uh, it's not just about plopping a piece of video art or a digital art animation into a screen. It has to uh, be about a holistic uh, thought uh, to create an immersive environment that's visually pleasing and also thought stimulating. Um, so then that space become uh, meaningful, and I think that's something we have to um, constantly keep in mind. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, we'd love for you guys to follow us on social media. That's our last tag, so please join <laughs> us on Instagram and other places. Great. And with that, um, just give a quick wrap-up notes here from the Digital Signage Federation. Uh, just quick reminder, September 21st is our next Hangout. We'll be talking about digital signage as a class, so uh, check out the DSF website for more information on that. Again, mark your calendar for October 25th. That'll be the DSE DSF breakfast at, during Digital Signage Week in New York. So make sure and check that out. And you know, as we've mentioned several times throughout, if you can, book your ticket and attend the DSE show in March in Las Vegas. I mean, you'll you'll be well educated and well versed on all things digital signage. So definitely uh, check that out as well. So with that, Amy Yelling, I appreciate your time sharing your insights on this really impressive project. And uh, to our Thank viewers so out there, great. And to our viewers out there, again, it's recorded. It'll be up on the DSF website by the end of the day. If you missed anything today, or you want to share it with your colleagues, thanks to everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.